You guys ready? All right. All right, welcome everybody. Thank you for joining us tonight. Uh, we are at the roof deck of the International Spy Museum in beautiful downtown Washington, D.C. For those of you um, watching on either the webcast or the pool, uh, there's about 150 guests here from throughout the D.C. institutions, including government, academia, think tanks, and industry. Um, we're going to have a relatively short program tonight. Um, and without further ado, I'd like to introduce Maureen Hinman. Thank you so much, Secretary Mayorkas, President Daniels, who will be here with us shortly, Deputy Undersecretary Carlin, Professors Ridd and Cohen, um, all the esteemed guests here tonight who have joined us from academia, a dozen or so government agencies and across uh, industry as well. I want to thank you so much for being here. Uh, Dimitri and I are just thrilled uh, to welcome you this evening. And uh, as we launch the Alperovich Institute with our partners at John Hopkins School of Advanced International Studies. Uh, the Alperovich Institute will see the first of what is hopefully many generations of leaders in the emergent field of cybersecurity, diplomacy, and statecraft. Through the provision of masters and PhDs, SICE will be both the first and first in class to bridge the gap between technology and statecraft and will fill a critical need in the diplomatic, intelligence, and private sector communities for professionals who are conversant in both technical and, geopoli and the geopolitical aspects of cyber statecraft. Now, as a former trade negotiator and a current international affairs wonk myself, I can attest to this knowledge gap. Um, in fact, uh, my husband famously required that uh, as a precondition to marriage, I clean up my act in terms of uh, password hygiene and uh, <laughs> submit to a number of undisclosed requirements in order to maintain our cybersecurity OPSEC. Um, jokes aside, Dimitri is a pioneer in conceptualizing the theater of uh, cybersecurity and in international, uh, uh, cyberspace in the, in the international security theater and, and its reverberations in the kinetic world and geopolitics. Uh, addressing these challenges to security has become a life's mission for Dimitri. And we believe that this partnership with SICE will become an essential school of thought in international studies. Um, thank you so much. And Dimitri, we'll take it away. Thank you, Maureen. And thank you for following my obnoxious advice and still agreeing to marry me. I want to reiterate Maureen's uh, appreciation for those of you who are on stage with us today as well as those of you who are in the audience. We're truly humbled by your support and participation in all of tonight's uh, activities and the launch of this institute. As someone who has spent 25 years in the field of cybersecurity, I have always been clear-eyed about the need to merge technical and policy acumen. While getting my cybersecurity graduate degree 20 years ago, I took the opportunity to attend numerous international affairs courses, believing that in order to understand what is happening in cyberspace, you have to understand what is happening in the world. That belief became prescient around seven years later when I received a call from a very small company, Google, um, who wanted to work with me on an intrusion they had just discovered, which was later attributed to the Chinese government. That event, when I, uh, which I named Operation Aurora, was a watershed moment in the cybersecurity industry. It was the first time that the broader public learned that foreign military and intelligence services were targeting private companies, a formidable threat that no one was adequately prepared to counter. It was also the first indication that nation states were becoming the top threat actors for organizations in the public and private sectors alike. That event led me to co-found CrowdStrike, now the world's largest cybersecurity company, where we changed the paradigm for what a cybersecurity firm is supposed to do by focusing on the adversary as opposed to the tactic that they were using and coined the phrase, we don't have a malware problem, we have an adversary problem. During my time at CrowdStrike, we investigated, attributed, and unveiled some of the biggest hacks of the last decade. But I always knew that technology was not enough. The reality is that we will never defend our way out of this problem. And that is why effective statecraft 
needs to be at the vanguard of anticipating and solving some of our cybersecurity challenges. Maureen and I are committed to doing our part to help field the next generation of cybersecurity and diplomatic leaders. We found that SICE, as a foremost international affairs school, has internalized this critical need to integrate policy with technology. The cyber problem at its core is a geopolitical one. The major adversaries that we face, Russia, China, Iran, North Korea, present challenges to us and our allies across the entire spectrum of threats, diplomatic, economic, kinetic, and cyber. SICE's commitment to the school of thought and our launch of the Alperovitch Institute is an acknowledgement that we can't address any of these challenges in isolation and without understanding the motivations and capabilities of each adversary. We thank you all for joining us tonight and we encourage you to be part of this new institution by sharing your knowledge as we develop the curriculum and by coming to the classroom to impart your wisdom on the graduate students this fall. And I have to tell you that working with a team at Johns Hopkins has been our deep, deep pleasure. The Johns Hopkins uh, University President, Ronald Daniels, Provost Sunil Kumar, the former SICE Dean, Elliot Cohen, the development and the finance teams, and of course, my partner in crime, Professor Red, have been true partners the entire way sharing our vision for this institute. It is my great pleasure to introduce the new director of the Alperovitch Institute, my good friend and colleague, Dr. Thomas Ritt. Thank you, Dimitri. Um, wow, what a setup. Uh, we live in a time of contradictions. A large number of us here in the United States also in Europe and elsewhere, have chosen to reject facts, often basic technical and scientific facts, and along with them the established institutions that guard the factual. Instead, many of us have placed their trust in their own tribes, in their own communities, and their own in-groups. Frequently, we've done so online, where hot emotions overcame cold analysis. Information operations, fakes, leaks, breaches, espionage, a destructive computer network attacks played a critical role in this disturbing development and will continue to do so at scale and in unexpected ways, which is where we come in. We, all of us, gathered on this roof today. We also are a recently formed community. We too have strong emotional bonds. And that bond is a shared passion for evidence, a shared passion for forensics, a shared passion for getting proven wrong, not right. We obsess over details, many of us, I know from experience. We um, argue over sources. We put proof before um, <clears throat> prejudice and increasingly we defend that truth against fierce adversity. This applies to the scholars here, this applies to the intelligence professionals here, this applies to law enforcement officers, it applies to um, investigative journalists on this, on this roof here today and to the policy analysts but it especially applies that passion for the evidence, it especially applies to an entire army of private sector investigators Many leading individuals from this uh, particular group are also here today. The, these individuals have attributed, have exposed adversaries again and again over the past dozen years, many hundreds of times, in novel ways that were simply unimaginable some, only 20 years ago. There will be moments when the people here under this sky will be led by the evidence into opposing camps, but for now, under threat on multiple fronts, our shared concern for guarding the facts, for disclosing threats, and for identifying those who harm us in hiding, for now those goals unite us more than they divide us. The Alperovitch Institute will help shape and help mature this besieged yet thriving and thrilling community of practice. We will do so in fresh ways that are sustainable and scalable through specialized MA education, through a unique PhD cohort, through executive education. By bringing in the most prolific 
and the most experienced researchers and, and investigators and thinkers in this field to teach, to write, uh, to build trust, trust in a community, trust in standards and in publications, and trust in a still evolving form of evidence. Trust really in a new type of institution. In short, we will do so by forging a new school of thought, the uh, Alperovich school of thought. A nice little pun that our provost actually came up with. I could not be more pleased today to introduce my friend and former colleague Mara Carlin, Dr. Mara Carlin. She's a SAIS uh, graduate and PhD. Dr. Carlin is currently performing the duties of Dep Deputary Undersecretary of Defense for Policy. Mara embodies the scholar practitioner. She studies, she writes, she teaches, she thinks, she decides, she acts, and she gets stuff done. And she does so at a level of excellence and frankly at a speed that has been an inspiration for many a student and has occasionally terrified colleagues who wonder why they can't be a little bit more like Dr. Carlin themselves. You, and she does all that in quiet. You will not see her tweeting. So all the more, uh, one, another reason f for why all of us uh, will now give you, Mara, your, our undivided attention. Thank you. Well, thank you for that much too kind introduction, uh, Thomas. It is a treat to be here. Thank you, Dimitri and Maureen, for all that you are doing. Um, you know, Thomas is a, a former colleague and someone who I am excited to continue learning from. I only wish I had had the opportunity to learn from him. Yeah, we got to get this a whole lot lower for me. We'll, we'll raise it up for the next folks. All right. Thank you. Um, I so enjoyed learning from Thomas when, when we were colleagues. And it's, uh, it's neat to be here because when I, when I was a student, we spent a lot of time studying the land, the sea, the air. And those domains have changed a whole lot, how we understand them. The multiplicity of domains has changed so much. And it's neat to know that tomorrow's students are going to not just get to learn from Thomas, but a whole lot of other folks. So uh, I've spent most of the last two decades either working in the Pentagon or working or learning at SAIS. And I have to tell you, the similarities are uncanny. Uh, and that's because in both places, you're surrounded by just brilliant folks. You know, what, what we often don't tell the students when we're professors is that we learn as much from them as their teachers than they're hopefully, you know, as much as they're learning from us as, uh, as, as the students. So now I'm at the Pentagon with this wonderfully convoluted title, as, as Thomas noted. Uh, and one of the neat things I get to do in this role is to oversee the development of the National Defense Strategy. So this is trying to figure out what is it that the Defense Department should try to do today and in the future. How do you think about spending many, many hundreds of billions of dollars in a thoughtful way so tomorrow's military is as ready for the challenges that might em emerge? And in doing this, we're spending a lot of time thinking about this role of integrated deterrence, which, of course, is a concept that I think should sing to all of us who live in the policy and academia world, who straddle that. Deterrence, of course, comes from academia, this idea of thinking about how we prevent conflict by dissuading aggression. And when you look out at today's security environment and the future security environment, there's a lot to be nervous about, right? There's a wide array of challenges that we all see. Efforts to undermine US strengths and to exploit vulnerabilities. And when I look at areas that make me particularly nervous for crises or areas of miscalculation, areas where it's not exactly clear what each folk, you know, what, what each, each individual is doing, where you see a difficulty in understanding risk, the cyber domain is just rife, rife with opportunity there in all sorts of worrisome ways. And when I look around the globe, of course, I see a whole bunch of actors who are exploiting this who are not perhaps behaving as responsibly as one might like, and who are taking efforts in what we call in the Defense Department below threshold, right? They're operating below the threshold of how we think about conflict to achieve strategic objectives. And that's really worrisome. And we need today's students to understand it and tomorrow's students to do it. So in this approach we have in the Defense Department these days, integrated deterrence, we're trying to look across domains, we're trying to look across our government and across our allies and partners. 
And I know this because the cyber piece is just so incredibly important, right? Thinking about how do you understand and leverage these unique, unique capabilities to try to uh, influence and, and allow precise effects at different magnitudes, which means we have a whole lot of questions that we've got to try to answer, right? How do we understand escalation? How do we understand miscalculation? How do we understand the tailored and bespoke ways that this domain can be most relevant, right? How do we think about these things? How do we think about deterrence as it relates to resilience in this domain? How do we think about issues like network degradation and mitigating attacks? How do we think about attribution? And just as importantly, how do we think about setting norms? Because for so many of us who deal with defense, we look around the world and we see lots of norms. And those norms have been especially established over the last 70 years, and they're very useful to global security and global stability. And so we need to figure out ways to do those in all sorts of other areas. So the way to do that, of course, is to get really smart young people thinking about it. Folks who will think about these questions I've outlined and so many more who will help us pierce our intellectual bubbles and tell us when, as Thomas notes, when are we calling things not exactly right? How do we make sure that those future students have, as Dimitri tells us, a rich, technical, textured understanding, and they can pair that with the policy approach as well? So I'm really excited that all of this tremendous work will enable tomorrow's policymakers to figure out these really hard issues. So with that, let me please turn to my former colleague, Dr. Elliot Cohen. It's the way it is. Um, thank you, Mara, uh, Mr. Secretary, President Daniels, Dimitri, Maureen, friends and colleagues. It's uh, truly wonderful to be here. Uh, I'm, my name is Elliot Cohen. I uh, was the, until recently, the Dean of Johns Hopkins SAIS. And actually one of the last things uh, that I was able to bring to fruition at the end of my deanship was the creation of the Alperovich Institute. And I will tell you that it is probably the one of which I am most proud. Now I should um, explain that normally when you go through something of this magnitude, it can only be described as something like a very stately minuet. Coming to terms on the creation of the Alperovich Institute was something uh, considerably more rapid paced, uh, maybe a little bit more like a Kazatsky, for those of you who know what that is. Um, a, it, was a, it was moved very fast, and it moved very fast, I think, because of what you've already seen, the clarity of Dimitri and Maureen's vision, um, the way it fit with what we do at SAIS, an extremely talented team. I want to give a particular shout out to uh, the former Associate Dean for Development, William Roth, who played such a critical part in this. Uh, it's easy to see why this is a fit. We're a policy school that are, is quite willing to roll up our sleeves and get into technical detail, and we know the importance of that. But I think in a more profound way, uh, the creation of this institute fits into what SICE is. We really have two missions. The first is to prepare our students for the work of the world. And you've just seen a great example of that in uh, my former student, Dr. Mara Carlin, who of course became, uh, eventually became my, my colleague as well. Um, we have students, graduates all over the Pentagon, the State Department, the intelligence community, uh, and with the Elperovich Institute, we'll do a lot more of that. And our second mission, and really equal mission, is to conduct cutting edge research that helps to inform and shape the public policy debate. So our feet are firmly planted in the public square. And uh, that will be even more important as we move to our new home in about a year and a half at 555 Pennsylvania Avenue. And that's another way in which I think the fit is just extraordinarily good. You know, one of the things that I've always loved about SICE uh, was reflected in Thomas's um, introductory remarks saying, we're hoping to see you all and see you as part of the work of the Institute. SICE has always been a place that doesn't look inward, but rather looks outward. And I think with 555 Pennsylvania Avenue, 
we'll see even more of that. It's not just gonna be Hopkins looking in at itself, it's gonna be Hopkins reaching out to the world. That's very much part of President Daniels' vi uh, vision and it fits. I wanna say one last thing uh, before I hand the podium over to uh, my new friend, uh, Dmitry Alperovich, who will introduce President Daniels. And that's about the subject of cybersecurity itself. It obviously is one that weighs on all of our minds in the way we experience it every day that we you know, look at a funny looking uh, email, but I think we also know what a serious and grave challenge it is to our national security. Well, why is that the case? Well, it's because as uh, Pericles said of Athens in the funeral oration, we throw our city open to the world. It's our openness that makes us vulnerable. It's also our openness that makes us strong. And I, I, as I look at uh, the, the uh, speakers here on the podium, uh, the thought that I have is there's one dimension of openness which you can see right here, which makes us strong. President Daniels is the son of refugees from Europe and an immigrant to the United States of America. Thomas Ridd is an immigrant from Germany. Dmitry Alperovich came here as a child from the former Soviet Union. I'll be introducing Secretary Mayorkas in a moment. He is also an immigrant. That's part of our great strength. It's the way in which we're open. And so it seems to me that it's particularly fitting uh, that this institute, with dealing with this set of challenges, be created by immigrants. Dimitri, over to you. So it is now my honor to introduce President Daniels, whose leadership at the helm of Johns Hopkins University since 2009 has facilitated a tremendous growth in the university's size and multidisciplinary reach. President Daniels' commitment to academic excellence and engagement in public policy has led to the creation of world-renowned multidisciplinary initiatives. President Daniels' leadership also led Johns Hopkins to acquire 555 Pennsylvania Avenue, the university's new flagship location in Washington, D.C., formerly the building that was, that was housed in the museum, and the home to the Alperovich Institute. Centrally located between Capitol Hill and the White House, the new location is at the vanguard of Washington's policy, uh, both substantively and geographically. I would be remiss not to mention President, President Daniels' new book, the, uh, what Universities Owe Democracies. This book could not be more timely as we celebrate the launch of the Institute that will help to shape our future leaders so that they can more ably protect our democratic values. Maureen and I are, are, are grateful and thank you from the bottom of our hearts and we're very much looking forward to building a world-class cybersecurity institute on the foundation we're laying here tonight. So without further ado, please welcome Johns Hopkins University President, Mr. Daniel. Uh, thank you so much, Dimitri and Maureen. Good evening, everyone, and welcome to our many distinguished guests, and especially Secretary Mayorkas. Uh, we immigrants, we get the job done. I like that theme here. Thank you, Elliot. Um, I'm delighted to join all of you to mark the launch of the Perovich Institute for Cybersecurity uh, Studies at Johns Hopkins University. Our setting tonight at the International Spy Museum feels particularly apt. In addition to the false teeth and invisible ink pens that kids clamor for in the gift shop, the museum is replete with artifacts of spy craft, surveillance, and espionage dating from the American Revolution. Now, possibly because I learned everything that I needed to know about spy craft from watching that iconic Cold War era TV series, Get Smart, I found myself particularly drawn to an interesting pair of shoes in the museum's tool trades uh, collection. It seems that American diplomats in the 1960s had to be especially careful where they sent their shoes for repair or cleaning because the KGB had developed a miniature radio transmitter that could be inserted into the soles of shoes without the wearer's knowledge. Thus, an American official who chose the wrong cobbler could be turned in a matter of hours into a walking source of counterintelligence, literally. 
Now, at the time, devices like the shoe transmitter were the height of technological sophistication. They were ingenious, insidious, manipulative, co-opting unsuspecting actors into divulging classified information. Fast forward several decades, it's clear that the terms of our environment have changed dramatically and the implements of foreign espionage are planted not just in shoes but in email inboxes, URLs, even DNA, replicating and attacking at a scale that is unimaginable even a decade ago. As speakers on this panel have already indicated, there's an urgent need for the kind of work that this institute will do, and uh, the case has never been clearer. Now, as our colleagues and supporters here tonight well know, private industry and the federal government have advanced promising initiatives to understand and combat these emerging threats, but universities too can and must play a critical role as vital partners in this project. As institutions deeply engaged in the preservation of thriving, stable democratic societies, universities are uniquely poised to marshal our expertise, to study and advance solutions to the greatest security challenges that threaten to undermine open and free societies and their citizens. Embedded in CICE and drawing from uh, the various divisions and disciplines across Johns Hopkins University, this new interdisciplinary center will be dedicated from the start to generating new research on cybersecurity, statecraft, and public policy, as well as to training the next generation of cybersecurity scholars and the experts to meet the threats of the future. And we're fortunate to have at Hopkins the scholar practitioner best suited to lead this effort, CICE Professor of Strategic Studies and inaugural director of the Perovich Institute, Dr. Thomas Ridd. An expert in cybersecurity and disinformation, Dr. Ridd has not only distinguished himself as a pioneering scholar and thinker, but has also been a fierce advocate for bringing his ideas about present day disinformation campaigns to policymakers and the public. And of course, we're truly, truly grateful to have the visionary support of the Institute's namesake, Dmitry Perovich and his wife, Maureen Hinman, a leading expert on trade and the environment. Dmitry and Maureen bring with them a deep understanding of some of the most urgent problems facing our world and a history of taking swift but deliberate actions to address them, whether leading the charge against some of the biggest attacks on the tech industry and our political system, in Dimitri's case, or co-founding the Silverado Policy Accelerator, a path-breaking, bipartisan think tank focused on security and sustainability. In addition to their devotion to bracing analysis and evidence gathering, they share with our university an equal commitment to ensuring that our best ideas reach the public they're meant to serve. To Dimitri, Maureen, Tom, and to our colleagues at SICE, especially former Dean Elliot Cohn. Elliot Cohn says, Mara's a student, former student of his. We're all former and continuing students of Elliot Cohn's. Thank you for bringing us together to launch this important and timely institute and doing so in record time. I look forward, as I know all of us do at Johns Hopkins, with great anticipation to all that the Aperovich Institute will accomplish in the months and years ahead. Thank you. Me again, but I'll be brief. Um, it's a great honor to introduce um, the Secretary of the Department of Homeland Security, Alejandro Mayorkas. Um, as I indicated in my earlier remarks, the son of immigrants from Cuba following the communist takeover of that island and indeed uh, before that of the Holocaust. Secretary Mayorkas uh, has had an extraordinarily distinguished career. He was, I believe, the youngest U.S. attorney in uh, the country when he was uh, first appointed um, in, uh, in Los Angeles. Uh, he's had a distinguished private sector career, but then returned to government in the Obama administration, uh, first as the director of uh, the Citizenship and Immigration Service, and then as deputy director of the department he now heads. Uh, I think the, the point that uh, I would like to make most, which I found truly stunning as I was looking at his biography, is in this time of all times, his nomination received overwhelming bipartisan support. And that, I think, testifies not only to his competence, but to the sense of principle and integrity, which was clearly visible to so many people. Mr. Secretary, it's an honor to have you here. Welcome.
Uh, thank you very much, uh, Professor Cohen, for the kind introduction. I'm very pleased that you were not in attendance at my confirmation hearing. Um, so s several years ago, um, a number of us were sitting around uh, the table and discussing the, um, the North Koreans' attack against Sony Pictures. And in the midst of the conversation, uh, one individual asked, uh, really posited the following. Uh, what if um, it was two in the morning, uh, the building, the Sony Pictures executive building was empty, and it wasn't a cyber attack, but actually the North Koreans bombed uh, the building and leveled it to the ground. What would our response as a nation be? And in the years past, the unique attributes of a cyber attack, its invisibility in a sense, the technical methods of intrusion, often led us to a more technical framing of the response both internally and externally. A focus on the technical means of remediation and resilience, and a rather unsystematic approach to delivering accountability. Since then, the line of distinction between the kinetic strike and the cyber attack has increasingly blurred, and correctly so. Just a few years ago, then Secretary Leon Panetta spoke of the danger of a cyber Pearl Harbor, a surprise attack that would debilitate our critical national functions. The framing aperture has widened. We well understand that we are facing determined and skilled adversaries launching intrusions for a variety of nefarious purposes, including classic espionage, theft of intellectual property, and destabilization of our democratic processes. We have accurately placed cybersecurity in the broader context. Dmitry Alperovich captured it perfectly in his tweet. We don't have a cyber problem. We have a China, Russia, Iran, and North Korea problem. A country's decision to deploy its Navy into an adversary's waters is not just a maritime issue. A country's decision to launch a cyber attack is not just a cybersecurity issue. When a nation la launches a cyber assault, it does so in the context of a broader bilateral relationship. When an individual or a group of individuals engage in malicious cyber attack, they are often given haven or license by a nation state. The means by which we address the myriad of cyber attacks, which are growing in frequency and gravity, are linked to our role and our responsibilities on the global stage. Dimitri, Maureen, thank you for your visionary le leadership in endowing this new institute and for bringing your expertise in cybersecurity and in trade and commerce to this critically important endeavor. On this dynamic landscape of cybersecurity, on a landscape where the applicability of decades of old rules of engagement are being questioned, where foundational questions remain unanswered and new rules are possible, the need for research and thought leadership that has practical relevance, that bridges theory and practice, is imperative. The new Alperovich Institute will be an extraordinary resource as we study, better understand, and confront cybersecurity challenges in the context of geopolitics and international affairs. Importantly, the Institute's goal of sustainability the development of the next generation of interdisciplinary educators and scholars in cybersecurity policy, the drive to equip and empower students to be the next generation of leaders on this frontier is a key to our safer and more secure future. The Alperovich Institute delivers on this need and it is here, thanks to Dimitri and Maureen, at a most critical time and juncture. I understand uh, this institute has been a few years in the making. 
and the vision for it developed in the confines of modern architecture in Georgetown and over great food at the Munich Security Conference. The Institute is privileged to have Professor Thomas Ridd as its founding director. Professor Ridd has helped shape the way we think about cyber warfare, disinformation campaigns, and more. He will now help raise the new generation of leaders at the intersection of cybersecurity and geopolitics, technology, and statecraft. He does so in a university uniquely positioned to lead the way, a university whose leadership, professors, and School of Advanced International Studies are at and continuously redefine the forefront of our knowledge, understanding, and thinking. On a personal note, I first met uh, Dimitri when I served as the Deputy Secretary of Homeland Security, a brilliant cybersecurity expert. For years, he has lent his expertise to the benefit of our department and our mission. He helps lead the way in making our country better, stronger, and safer. He does so as one born abroad, one who is naturalized, a United States citizen by choice. He is a powerful reminder of what America can mean when it is at its very best. Dimitri, Maureen, and everyone who is a part of this institute, thank you for this groundbreaking novel, extraordinarily meaningful institute. It is going to make a difference in the world. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. Uh, we're going to have a reception, so please uh, make your way over to the tables. Enjoy yourselves. We'll be open until about 8.30 or 9. Thank you for coming.